please welcome Dr. Paul Zablocki. Hey, good morning, everybody. As you heard, my name is Paul Zablocki. I work in the Strategic Technologies Office. Boy, I can't see anybody out there. That's amazing. Um, so welcome to day two of DARPA Forward. Uh, really looking forward to this exciting system of autonomy panel that you're, you'll hear about today. Um, just a little bit about myself. My research interests include applications of AI to command and control, tactical military command and control, as well as multi-agent, multi-domain autonomy. And we'll be covering some of that in the, the uh, panel today. I have a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. On behalf of the Systems of Autonomy panel members and myself, I'd like to thank The Ohio State University and DARPA for hosting and all of you for attending this morning's session. Did everyone enjoy Mike Leahy's Redefining Future Platforms? That was pretty cool, right? And Stuart Young's alias demo, Remote Control Helicopter or, or autonomous helicopter, really cool. I myself prefer large numbers of very low-cost autonomous systems, um, but these bigger ones are cool too. Um, these are great examples of what we're going to talk about in the panel today. Imagine for a moment that we could get those to work together to carry out missions, to collaborate without a lot of human intervention. Well, that's what we're shooting, to discuss, shooting for to discuss today. That's what we'll cover. So systems of autonomous systems consists of multiple autonomous agents. These can be different agents collaborating together to carry out missions. And you can think about different agents as, as autonomous platforms that might have different sensors, different processing capabilities, um, electronic warfare perhaps, navigation capabilities, even kinetic capabilities, weapons type systems. They could be air, ground, sea, you saw underwater yesterday from Mike. They could even be in space. Remember the robots that were fixing satellites up there, refueling satellites? That was pretty cool. Um, the panel will describe the importance of these autonomous systems to the DOD uh, and examine challenges associated with how you would make them work together. Um, we'll touch upon military applications now and in the future. We'll consider trades associated with the quantity versus the cost and the levels of autonomy that we're willing to live with. And in fact, for those of you who saw the risers yesterday, DePeak uh, from Carnegie Mellon University showed an adaptable small robot that could go upstairs. It was really cool. In fact, he did a, a great demonstration of pouring olive oil on a ramp and showing that it could adapt to climb. Imagine if we could get multiple robots to work together to achieve those kind of, maybe the robot has to go over a wall and it needs another robot to help. So that might give you a sense of the types of things we'll touch upon. We'll discuss things like, how do you experiment when you're talking about larger numbers? How do you, how do you scale this? How do you test things that are adaptable? So I'd like to take a moment to introduce our four panel members uh, and then start, start the discussion. So our first panel member, Mr. Chris Kroeniger, is the Emerging Overmatch Technologies Essential Research Program Manager at the Army Research Lab. His research interests include single and multi-agent autonomy to include heterogeneous team control and agent assignment. Chris received a master's degree in aerospace engineering from Penn State University. Our second panelist, Dr. Amber Walker, is Technical Director for Land Systems at Andrel. Prior to this, she was the Associate Director for Autonomous Research at Raytheon BBN and a DARPA Program Manager in the Tactical Technologies Office. Her research interests include human-robotic interaction, multimodal and wearable control, shared autonomy, and other technologies to manage warfighter mental workload. She holds a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Oklahoma. Next panelist, Dr. Stuart Young. You saw him yesterday with Alias. You're going to hear about other programs today that he's working on. Dr. Stuart Young is a program manager in the Tactical Technologies Office at DARPA. His research interests include autonomous and unmanned ground and air vehicles, intelligent behavior for unmanned systems, multi-agent teaming, applied artificial intelligence and machine learning, and field robotics. Stuart received his PhD in systems engineering from the George Washington University. 
And last but not least, Dr. Michael Kinn, we call him Q, and you'll see why, is the Expeditionary Robotics Program Officer at the Office of Naval Research. His research interests include robotics and autonomy, cognitive science, artificial intelligence, and human-machine teaming. Q received his PhD in psychophysics and psychophysiology from the Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology Program. And maybe you can say a few words about those degrees uh, as we talk. Um, so the panel members have created this OV1, and I, I'm hoping you can see it on the screen right now, that we can all talk to and kind of, kind of uh, present the types of work we're doing. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and kick off the discussion uh, by talking briefly about my programs. And then we'll go down the, the line here and, and have each uh, panel member discuss what they're working on. And then what we really want to do, though, is take questions from you. So right after we finish that, we'll jump in and, and take some questions from the audience. So I'm really exploring planning and execution of large numbers of low-cost autonomous systems with the goal of overwhelming adversaries. Just put enough mass out there that the environment becomes very, very confusing. And so my goal is to do that without actually affecting um, the systems that I'm taking advantage of. So in other words, I want to be able to use autonomous systems that these folks are developing and bring them together in new ways without really having to make many, many modifications to what they're working on. So that's my focus area. And I'll go right down the line, and maybe Q, you could say a few words about the things you're working on. Yes, yeah, so, so thank you, uh, Paul. To, to follow on uh, Paul's desire to have a uh, series, system of systems, uh, it, ONR's uh, Expeditionary Robotics Program is really focusing on a particular form of uh, federation. Uh, we, we call it enumerated powers layer cake federalism, uh, sort of defending America using the foundations of the uh, American principles. And in this system, uh, the, we, we are very explicit that the upper echelons maintained upper echelon powers, and those powers not specifically allocated to the upper echelons and not specifically forbidden from the lower echelons are then dedicated uh, to the lower, de uh, delegated to the lower echelons uh, and to the individual agents. And using this layer cake uh, federation, uh, we hope to test uh, the principles of uh, collective action. So th is it possible to have uh, unif uh, unity of effort uh, without the necessitating the unity of command? So the, the way that we're doing it now, I think this is uh, one of the things that we hope to present, is unscripted force on force experimentation. So I wrote this down so I won't forget it. So um, now we are uh, engaged in a great civil debate, uh, testing whether the federation that we created uh, or any federation thus conceived and constructed uh, can endure. So uh, unscripted force on force experimentation is to invite uh, industry, uh, academia, as well as the military labs to come together and in a peer-on-peer uh, -peer engagement, test some of our assumptions and to discover our critical dependencies. So uh, that, that's it for my Thanks, respect. Thanks, Stuart. Stuart? Thanks, Paul. Uh, so I'd like to start with um, in, in addressing the question of systems of autonomy. I've had many conversations with leaders in the military, especially on the Army side, and there's a strong desire as we go looking towards 2040, 2050, the desire to use many systems of autonomy. And one of the things that I recognized in some of those conversations is that we better get busy creating the capabilities that they're after, that they envision. And one of the things that um, I recognized in those conversations was that the robots at the lowest level can't do what they're envisioning that they might need to be able to do. And so, uh, I, obviously I talked about ALIAS a little bit yesterday, that, that goes a little bit towards that, but my RACER program, which stands for Robot Autonomy in Complex Environments with Resiliency, is focusing on high-speed off-road maneuver, mobility and maneuver, um, in environments that are complex that the military frequently finds itself in, which is a distinctly different problem than what the self-driving community addresses. And 
the idea is that we want autonomy to no longer be the limiting factor in how fast we can maneuver on the ground, in the ground domain. Um, so we're focusing on improving the speeds. Um, I find the current speeds of robots in the, in the ground domain very unsatisfying, and so we need to get after that. Um, they're also way too brittle. And so hence the second R in, in, res in RACER, the resiliency, systems need to adapt to the environment that they're in. Uh, they can't be always calling home. We can't depend on just deep learning approaches that are um, tr problematic when you go outside their training domain. So RACER is really focused on addressing that foundational problem, which I think is also a cornerstone or foundation um, in the ground domain for realizing uh, the goal that we're talking about here on this panel of systems of autonomy. Thanks, Stuart. Amber? Good morning. Um, <clears throat> kind of doubling down on what Stuart is describing, uh, I think my career so far, both as an Army officer and then you know, outside of uniform for the last couple of years, has really been focused uh, primarily on creating technologies that are multiplicative to the warfighter, intuitive and easy to employ. Um, so my focus on human-robot interaction has you know, previously looked at various methods to interact with robots that are not as visual as, you know, full uh, video feeds and, and you know, lots of joysticks and laptops around our neck, if you remember how we deployed some of our very first uh, unmanned vehicles. Um, at Andrel, uh, I'm doing that as the technical director for land systems. So really what that means is I'm leading strategy and growth for Andrel Industries um, into land systems, which includes ground vehicles. Uh, using a software backbone that we call Lattice. So we are a five-year-old company, a private defense firm still, and we are focused on using private capital and commercial money to solve defense department problems. Um, robotics is a huge part of that. We like to say that we're building autonomous systems, not unmanned systems. So we are really focused on the future where vehicles require less low-level interaction and more, to your point, Paul, command and control. So we're very interested to hear about your new program. Um, and I think, you know, for the future of defense, if we look at adversaries and the environments that we're going to operate in, we truly believe at Andrel that the largest problems and challenges still remain in software vice hardware. And so we're looking at software informed hardware enabled design is kind of our brand of, of product. Um, and I look forward to building out more of it in the years to come at the company. Thanks, Amber. Chris? Yeah, so Paul, thanks for inviting me to be part of the panel today. So um, at ARL, I'm a program manager looking at protection. So what I want you to envision is a, a small unit of ground combat vehicles, tanks, Bradleys, these sorts of things. And uh, we want these to be able to survive uh, high volume of fire. Uh, so we're looking at how autonomy can be incorporated and distributed across that system. So not thinking about vehicle protection going beyond just what's on the surface of a single vehicle, but how they can organize and coordinate uh, across the unit to protect all of the, uh, all of the assets. Uh, so it employs a variety of countermeasures, all of which are intended to be deployed autonomously uh, because these sorts of engagements are going to happen at uh, you know, faster than human time scales. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I just want to remind everybody to please enter questions um, into the app so that we can see your questions and answer them. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started with some questions right now, in fact. And um, um, so first question, what do you imagine being the role of learning in multi-agent environments? And I'll, I'll hand that one to Q, maybe. Um, I, 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 I think the, the way that I would uh, try to rephrase the, the question a little so that I, I can <laughs> stand a chance of answering it uh, <laughs> is that uh, there is the kind of learning that will happen um, in action uh, on, at, at the time of the event. So during those times, there is going to need, we're going to need to have uh, what we've been calling computational um, a theory of mind. So that the agents are going to have to start to surmise from one another uh, what the other agent is trying to do, what the other agent has in its uh, sensory capabilities as well as its action capabilities. 
So the, the way that the multi-agents will have to interact uh, in, in the world and then learn from each other will actually have to be in real time. And so in order for us to get there, the agents that we have will, will need to have this notion that there are other minds or other agents and not just uh, the, the meta mind of everybody is just part of me. Uh, we have an established communications protocol. We, we know everything about each other so that they actually have to, for the multi-agent environment to work, the agents will actually have to learn about each other as they're interacting with one another. I, I, I hope that, that answers the spirit of the question. Comments or? Well, I, I, I just like to comment, you know, I feel, you know, that clearly the agents need to um, learn and adapt their behaviors based on their peers and, and peer agents, just like humans do. And I think that one of the strengths of the opportunity that we have in this doing the systems of autonomy idea is that the agents can continue to learn from one another um, and more importantly, I believe, is adapt. And I think this is one of the key features that is unique um, or a cornerstone of our military is our leaders and our soldiers are always able to adapt. And so I think trying to emulate those type of behaviors where the agents can learn from one another and they can learn to riff off of each other or learn to um, you know, understand the intents of, of their, their peers um, and also their human peers, I think will be a key enabler to enabling these systems to be more functional for us. So it sounds like you're supportive of learning at the edge or learning during operations. Is that the case? There's, there's been some controversy over that, whether you want to have them learn back in the, the lab and then not have them learn well, going I, forward. I, I, if that question is directed to me, I, I would say it's actually critical that uh, the agents and the, the, uh, the system of system structure allows for uh, that type of learning uh, or that type of adaptation, uh, that uh, the, our agents have to have the mechanisms and our system of systems have to have the communication uh, built in. So for, for example, r right now, if uh, Superior uh, gives an order to uh, the subordinate, uh, the subordinate can actually repeat back this is what you told me to do. I'm going to have 60% casualty doing this. Uh, are you sure, sir? Right? So, and then the answer could be yes or, oh, I wasn't aware of that local information. Right now, some of the systems don't have the ability to talk back. And some of the agents don't have the ability to talk back. So, I think in order for multi-agent environment to exist, we're going to need the agents to have the ability to talk back in a respectful of chain of command way. And also the system has, to, the system of systems has to have the ability to uh, facilitate or allow for that. Does that? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think, I think, I think it's essential. I don't think it's an option. I think uh, if we get ourselves stuck in the ability or in systems that can't adapt and learn, then we won't be able to achieve our objectives. Um, certainly, you know, we don't want agents going off the reservation, um, <laughs> so to say, but, you know, we work in a structured environment. The military is very used to that structured environment, and so there's always bounds on the constraints of, of what, what they can learn and how they can adapt to execute the commander's intent. So I, I look at it as they can adapt, they can learn, they have to in order to more uh, eloquently or sophisticate, in a more sophisticated fashion execute the commander's intent. What I think where that learning takes place is imperative. It, it must be in the field, right? You, you must learn at the edge or you're not learning the right lessons. We've taken robotics out of the lab and into the field how many dozens of times to be surprised by things that we just can't replicate in modeling and simulation yet. Um, so I think you know what we're finding in our deployments of technology, and we, we spend a lot of our time deployed with our assets right now trying to understand how they're going to behave in a realistic environment. If you're not learning at the edge, then you're probably not learning the right lessons, I think is, is where we're currently at. Yeah, and if I could add just you know, one way I look at this, you know, if you look at the self-driving community as an example, they're trying to you know, learn the lesson. You know, they built off of a lot of what was done at DARPA and the Grand Challenge. And what we're seeing is that they're constantly chasing the edge cases. And so they rinse, wash, repeat this design process to get things to be perfect and, and I think the reality is that the state space is infinitely large and so that type of approach 
um, won't um, work for us, especially since we can't depend on the structure and the environment. Um, the, the space is too big for us to be able to do that. And so we have to be able to have systems that adapt and learn um, on the fly so that they don't um, get stuck in this um, design cycle that the self-driving community currently finds itself in. Uh, because you know we can't possibly collect enough data to train them in the way that they're trying to do it. Yeah, and I, I'm, from my perspective, I would say, you know, riffing off of what Q said initially, right? I'll, all of this builds on intent, which requires that intent, just as with human soldiers, right? We don't really want soldiers to go into novel environments and not know what to do, figure out, right? So that intent comes from experimenting in field exercises in the United States before we deploy, perhaps in simulation, uh, and ideally do as little learning in actual combat situations as possible, right, to be successful. But it does require certainly engagement in the real world. If I can take another second or so to, uh, to follow up with Chris. Uh, so uh, the military the, the is moving toward that mission command uh, notions, right? So the idea of that uh, bilateral trust and the bilateral commitment is very important. And I think we, if we're going to build synthetic agents or cultured agents to come in and interact closely with humans, the, the agents has to have that ability to uh, read into the implicatures, right? Take that hill at all costs means very different things uh, depending on which commander uh, gave that. Eisenhower versus Patton will give you a very different implicature. Yeah. And th that being an important aspect, I think, of multi-agents going into the future. And especially, I think, pa Paul, you, uh, in, 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 our, in our discussions uh, about your programs in the past, uh, the idea that, that the, the agents that we're going to be working with are going to be from different vendors, from, from different uh, corporate mindsets, or even uh, from different uh, strategic partners in the, in the world. We, we can't insist that they have the same architecture and they can't have the same uh, protocol, but they need to be interoperable. And with humans, the interoperability comes in with this notion that we can try to read minds, where theory of mind, right? That there are other minds exist. And I also, to, to follow up on Stuart's comments, uh, that, that uh, the edge cases, is, is that, that's gonna be a big deal because combat, unlike driving in the urban environment, uh, low base rate events, that, that's what ex exactly what our, our adversary is gonna impose on us, right? So, uh, the past is a good indication that the future might break down at the very moment that you need uh, a good decision to be made. I want to emphasize something here, though, because a lot of times we talk about commander's intent and mission command, and it sounds like a one-off, right? We're going to give one intent, and then the asset is going to go open loop. And that's not how war is fought. Right. It is a continuous command and control. And so where we're failing, I think, is not just in... Uh, communicating intent, which we're, we're spending, I think, a lot of money and time trying to consider how to do, but also the command and control continuously in the operation. Because if I am Eisenhower and the robot thought I was Patton, <laughs> I, will, I will notice that, right? If I'm doing effective command and control, right. I will get indicators that I don't think it understood what I meant. Let me restate or let me give it something more explicit. Um, so I really, you know, I, th I think it's important that we know that autonomous systems are continuously under development, that command and control is a continuous uh, activity, and that if we create effective interaction mechanisms between the humans and the autonomous systems right. over time, um, we, we should be able to work, I think, through and beyond many of these challenges. Yeah, I think one of the things that Q said that was, it's always been striking me, and I think we all have observed it in our experiences, is that you know we're talking about being able to have capabilities against a peer adversary, and a peer adversary means that they're a thinking, learning, adaptive and adversary, and so they're very, gonna, very quickly going to understand our tells and our behaviors if we don't adapt our behaviors. And so to Amber's point about the intent's going to be constantly adjusting because we're also a, a knowledgeable thinking, ad, learning ad, um, opponent for them. Uh, our agents need to be similarly adaptive to those types of things. Um, you know, so I think that that's 
one of the things that I, I, I strive for as we move into racer, and I know, Paul, you're looking at this as well in your programs, is we have to not just be comfortable in our sandbox or lab space or a very sterile outdoor environment, but we need to really put our systems up against you know, representative peer adversaries and see how they break, because we know they'll break catastrophically, as you've learned from some of your things. And so we need to continue to build on those <laughs> examples and make sure that the systems are resilient to those types of things. Well, great conversation. Um, let's, let, <laughs> let's move on a little bit to, um, you know, we just kind of touched upon testing here a little bit. Um, so maybe we could talk for a few minutes about testing and, and what's involved. I think, Stuart, you just brought up something that I'm kind of passionate about is we do need to test against people who will react to the system. So not the normal way we go out to a test range and let's show everybody that our autonomous platforms function, right? We need to be able to test in realistic environments and have people try to counter it. Uh, for me personally, I'm trying to look at very large scales, right? I want to overwhelm an adversary with large numbers that I grabbed from all of you right on the on the battlefield. Um, so what do you think some of the challenges are with with testing these? So, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm working on foundational capabilities in racer currently, but as we continue to turn up the knob on on the environments that we're testing the autonomy in, uh, we're seeking to make the environment more and more realistic. Um, of course, Right now, I feel like I'm in the mode of robot versus the environment because that's brutally hard at this point. But where we really need to get to is when we start um, having the robots deal with dynamic things, features in the environment. Um, I just got back from my second experiment, and uh, one of the things that we were not expecting is a herd of elk to cross in front of the robots, um, <laughs> which got out of the way in time, but uh, we still it still showed up in our cost maps. and. So we had to deal with that, which was a fun, unexpected uh, encounter. Um, and of course, they were not being adversarial, they were trying to get away. But um, so I totally <laughs> agree as we, as we progress, especially in Racer and other follow-on efforts, and I know you and I've talked about this, is we need to turn up the knobs on what the adversaries are gonna do to try to deny us the ability to do what we're um, trying to do um, with our autonomous systems. Because if we don't, we'll have these very pristine, systems that can operate in a quasi-sterile environment and won't be, won't have been suspect or subjected to the real type of environments that our adversaries want to do. So, you know, as we talk about systems of autonomy, I think as we build these foundational capabilities, we need to get into demonstrating the capabilities against a peer adversary and the peer adversary may have the exact same capabilities or to me in the limit, you know, you have our asset, our systems of autonomy go up against their human level intelligence because they could, you know, in a test type environment, they could have perfect calm, perfect communications and see how well we could stand up to that. So I think as we build, we need to keep that in mind. And um, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we have the process that we're doing in Racer. Um, and I think that as we get more mature with some of the foundational things, we need to start introducing additional characteristics that are maybe unseen or how the adversary is acting against us. So we'll be doing that as we move into our next experiments with starting to go not just mobility, as we've talked about from A to B, but doing it in a, a combatly, combat efficient way, maneuver, you know, where, does the, where is the enemy or where do I think the enemy might be so I can maneuver in a way that's um, a way that a, a soldier might operate and keep turning that knob up um, as we go. So, so, Chris, you and I have had some conversations about communications, and I think I just heard uh, Stuart talk about, well, we need to be able to test in communications denied or degraded environments. So thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely true. I, I think there's uh, often a desire to just imagine there's going to be ubiquitous communications, which invariably fails on, uh, when we get out in the field and the range and test. And, you know, in these protection scenarios, we're often only working over two, three, four kilometers, and comms is routinely failing. And there's no adversary even in the picture. It's just the environment. Um, so, you know, I, we're certainly pushing on a, a few different ways to address that, right? One is just having kind of a good database, right? So if some, an asset knows about a threat over here, when it finally can communicate to the others, then everybody else knows, right? So it's sort of database management, good engineering tools. Um, uh, but then a lot of it just goes back to, uh, you know, that 
intent we were talking about earlier, right? That, that every asset knows what its mission should be in a given situation. And so even in lacking communications, things are going to happen. And that provides the hook for learning uh, in the future as well. Cool, thank you. Um, so we have a great question from the audience next. Um, the federated approach described by Q implies that these autonomous systems are dependent to a degree on human C4 and are therefore vulnerable to comms attacks. How do you propose to maintain resilience? So I think we kind of touched upon this a moment ago, but maybe we could um, dig into that a little deeper. So I'll just, I'll just start, and uh, Q probably has some things to say at, at a little bit higher level, but I want to start just at the foundational level. Um, one of the ways that I'm looking at dealing with that is that our systems for, uh, especially like on the racer side, we're not being dependent on GPS. Uh, so we're currently using it a little bit, um, but as the program progresses, I'm turning up the knob, and I just did this at the, first ex the second experiment where we started turning up um, GPS jamming type effects so they can't be dependent on it for their local state estimation. Um, so that's one way we're trying to be resilient to that, that we're not dependent on you know, GPS for localization. And I think similarly, well, the agents have to be have enough autonomy to execute what their plan is and not just go with this assumption that I lose comms, I have to go home to my safe space, because I think that's a very easy exploit for them to take advantage of. Uh, that, that's a great uh, Thanks for teeing it up so I can follow with that. So uh, uh, I think Stuart and I uh, uh, chooses a slightly different approach when we do our autonomy, right? So uh, right now I'm forcing our performers, coaxing our performers uh, into um, dealing with the robot as they are. We, we're committed a lot more to the embodiment where the, 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 uh, the software has to uh, acknowledge the limitation of the hardware. Either you make the hardware better or you deal with what you have and make the uh, software better to accommodate uh, for the hardware. Um, on, the, on the specific question about what happens if somebody attacks your uh, C4, uh, we, we are doing uh, orienteering, so uh, as a way of um, a, a land navigation. So, so uh, uh, soldiers as well as Marines are, are taught how to uh, navigate using uh, landmarks and using uh, celestial navigation. So, and, and during the daytime, there's only one star you have to pay attention to, so the celestial navigation is easier. Um, and, and using that techniques to get rough estimates to, to uh, prosecute. And as far as getting commands, um, uh, prior to joining ONR, I, I, I supported the submarine force. And when the hatches close, you go with the orders that you were given. And there's a great deal of autonomy granted uh, to the commanders. So that autonomy is granted because of years of demonstrations of, of the trust and the capability. Yep. So both the competency of the system has to be high, as well as uh, the envelope of operation, spatial temporal op envelope of operation. So uh, if you have proficiency and you have the trust of the commanders, you can go for a period of time without checking. And when it comes to when you really have to communicate, there is sneaker net, right? So we can run messages. Um, Stuart had talked about his pigeons. I've, I've, I've upgraded a little bit, and now we send out ravens. Um, Game of Thrones reference for those of you who are not familiar. Um, so we, we actually have birds that are able to go out and communicate. So we have bucket brigades. So communication uh, doesn't have to be uh, radio communication. Um, we have built into our program, uh, just as, as recent as two weeks ago, uh, a waggle dance. Uh, from from bees, uh, so our drones and our our, um, our autonomous systems may behave in a way to communicate messages across. So communications through perception, I believe that's what you guys are doing right now, right? So audition, vision, uh, maybe even tactile sensations to indicate friendliness and and collaboration. So those things are available. Uh, to us as uh, thinking agents, maybe we can start to imbue it into our autonomous systems. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so another question from the audience, and I think this one is probably for Amber. Uh, 
how do we integrate with man systems without overwhelming the human cognitive ability? And your background as a soldier uh, prior to your current job is probably well suited yeah, for this. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, a lot of it, I think, currently comes down to the level of autonomy that we're expecting or anticipating in the, in the unmanned or robotic asset. So. Um, we're not gonna get there, we're not gonna unburden the operator if I have to give it every actuator command, you know, <laughs> pulse with modulation level. So we have to be able to bring it up several levels. We have to be able to build autonomy that can take higher level, I mean, back to the intent-based commands that we were giving before. And then we need to be able to bring our systems together into a single display, and I hesitate to say display because, again, I don't think everything should be visual. I really think, you know, we are multimodal sensory uh, bodies, and we need to use more of our senses for more of our interactions uh, with our unmanned assets, but I think bringing those things together in an interoperable way so that I don't have a soldier pivoting from one uh, double screen to another double screen and then having to open six other windows to do the next thing, you know, really bringing those systems together. And I think the way, I think we're on track to get to that point, right? The, um, the commercial standards and how we develop software and the types of approaches that companies are naturally adopting that do software for a living are leading us towards a more open and flexible set of architectures um, where I think you are going to be able to see these individual programs, many assets come together. And we've proven this out at some scale already at Andrel, as I know several other companies have. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> Well, and there was, there was actually a first part of this question too, which I, I thought we'd take it out of order, but I think it follows with your open architecture approach. So, you know, I, I started out by talking about how do we bring all of these different capabilities to have them work together? But of course, having some kind of centralized control can lead to some security challenges. So I myself have done some work, in fact I had a small business innovative research effort to look at how different autonomous systems could watch one another mm -hmm. and you know, try to look for anomalous behavior and then decide, well I'm gonna flag that platform because I don't trust it. Something is wrong, I don't trust it. Uh, but I, I, I'm hoping like open architecture help some of that and maybe more decentralized control, but what are your thoughts on that? My biggest thought is that I worry, I think the way the, the question was phrased had something to do with a single system being vulnerable. I think my concern is that our fear over a single vulnerable system is gonna keep us at zero systems. If we are, if we get over that first hump, right, we will have more than one. There will be one for a period of time and it will be vulnerable. But mimicry, right, and we all copycat good ideas that will expand and, and once you get more competition and more variables, you will naturally become more resilient. So I think we, we should get over that fear of that intermittent period. Um, and I'd be interested on your perspective on this, Chris, but I think there's gonna be an intermittent period where we probably are you know, looking at some brittleness in our initial approach. You've seen it in the ground vehicle world. Um, but if we're not willing to be brittle for a little bit of time, we can't really harden ourselves to it down the line. Great. Yeah, I'm not sure how to respond to that. To, to be brittle, right? And this gets beyond the technology question, and it's what will operators accept and program program managers are not our kind of program managers, but people actually buy systems for the army in large volumes and don't want buyer's remorse. Um, but I, I think you're right. I think part of the cultural shift that army leadership is going to need to adopt is that autonomous systems aren't going to be this widget, right? I can't evaluate it by it's <clears throat> this hard and it can operate at this temperature, right? That just like a soldier, right? These are things that evolve that will get better over time through training and, uh, and that you're going to learn to trust and that trust is not not a binary quantity, right? I might trust the robot in this situation and I don't trust it all in that situation. And because I've trained with these things and worked with them, I know when I can trust it, when I can't. Yeah, I, think, uh, so. okay. I think that the, you know, one way to deal with this and 
is, and I've been dealing with people dealing with human robot interfaces for a long time, Amber and I've talked about this a lot, is we just need the robots to get a lot better than they have been in the past. And they can't be so brittle. And to Q's point um, about on the Navy side, one thing that I was very much inspired by my office, we had the opportunity to go visit a shipyard. And as an Army guy, I never had been on a submarine. And so this notion of how these things go off the you know, often do their mission with the commander's intent autonomously was very inspiring to me. Um, there's this level of trust that's been established to do this particular task. And so I think along the lines of what you're saying is we've got to interact with them at a higher level than, than the low level mechanical, but like higher level, can they do these certain missions, those types of things. I think that will help to make the human robot teaming better, um, much more analogous to the way humans do it. You know, you don't tell them how to get to the hill. You they so take the hill as you've used, and you trust the chain of command to have their unit maneuver to make that happen. So I think similarly, um, demonstration, capability demonstration, and then training with the systems um, is something that we a little bit lost sight of, I think, when we were doing the Gulf War and, and the uh, insurgency operations over the last decade, where we were really sending technology, but we didn't really have the opportunity to train them, so these systems were fraught with brittleness, but the users, did, the humans didn't have a really appreciation of where they would excel and where they wouldn't. And I think we need to not forget that aspect of it. So the training point uh, to demonstrate the trust, they need to have a chance to demonstrate what they can do. And of course, what they can't do and act accordingly. So, so I've found simulation experiments with live operators very helpful, especially when you talk about large numbers of autonomous platforms and getting them involved, you know, over and over again, you know, over over time to get comfortable and to actually shape how you would use these capabilities. So I've done that with the Army and, and found that very, very valuable. I, I, I'd like to follow up with the uh, simulated uh, humans with multi-agents. And, and this is one of the reasons we're, we're actually pushing it to go outside, right? So uh, a lot of times a researcher will think, well, you know, the baby's not ready yet, the baby's not ready yet. Uh, I found that uh, the Marines have been able to make great effect on a piece of garbage that we thought wasn't ready yet. And they go, oh my God, are you kidding me? If I had this, X event would not have occurred. And so um, I, I, I would like to really push out this notion that, uh, uh, I think it's uh, 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 Proverbs uh, uh, 27, 17, uh, iron sharpens iron, right? So if we would just get together and actually test these things out with the soldiers, with our half-baked equipment, we would get better idea about what we need to work on next, and they would get a better idea of what is coming. So that interaction between tactics and technology, I think is one of the things that we, we might have been missing up to this point. Cool. I think we probably have time for one more question from the audience. Uh, and this one I think we touched upon, but uh, maybe we can go into a little more detail. Do you look to biological systems for inspiration <laughs> when designing any of your AI or learning systems? And if so, how are they useful? And I think, Q, you actually touched upon this a little bit. Right, so, so um, uh, I'll, I'll go quick. So I, I, I was trained as an electrical engineer in signals and systems at um, a, Purdue University, uh, not far from here. Uh, and then they, uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> they cross-trained me in uh, experimental psychology and neuroscience. So the way that I'm doing the, uh, running the expeditionary robotics program is very much inspired by what I had to learn uh, in graduate school. So taking um, uh, insect, social insects, uh, as, as an analogy, we're, we're trying to do swarming uh, the, the way that Stuart would want swarming to be done. <laughs> um, and, and really uh, look at how uh, the different systems can interact. So the system of systems uh, interaction, uh, where the um, hierarchy is not as uh, established, right? So the, the queen bee, uh, she doesn't do command and control. The queen bee lays eggs. Um, and so the command and control is actually in the hive itself. So uh, we are using that type of things. It is still at a 6162 level. Um, it'll be a while before I think that kind of organizational structure will be uh, accepted, tolerated uh, uh, by uh, the 
traditional uh, military doctrine. But I, I hope that through Iron Sharpens Iron, we'll, we'll get a chance to show the efficacies in special cases for such an organizational style. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I draw inspiration from biological systems every day. Um, when I walk my dogs, um, sometimes I'll mess with them because they know the route, and then I'll be like, well, that's not the route I want to take today. And, but I'm observing how they react to what they think that I want to do, and then how they quickly react to what I am changing the plan to be. Um, even this morning, it was great. I was crossing the street from the hotel to my car, and I couldn't see the bus driver waving me across because um, of the glare. And so I was just trying to figure out how this, this communication that was nonverbal, mm -hmm. how we were interacting as two different agents. Um, I had an expectation of what he was going to do. He had an expectation of what I was going to do. And it was very seamless. And so I'm like, well, how the heck do we get autonomous systems to do that level of interaction and, and feedback so that we can interact with them, as Amber said, in a nonverbal way? <laughs> well, so thank you very much for, uh, for um, attending the panel this morning. I hope we've convinced you there's still a great deal of research to be done in order to fully realize the potential of systems, of autonomous systems for military applications. If this panel sparked your interest, we'll be around during the breaks and over lunch, and we'd love to talk to you uh, more about it. And we're certainly always looking for new ideas and new approaches. So, so please join me in thanking our panelists.